trivia software engineer. Um, my interaction with hardware is usually asking them to implement a hardware idea that I have, and then we try to work together. That I work on software, they work on hardware. So typically, they're like two different worlds completely. Um, but I think that they both augment one another. So software can make your hardware project cooler, and hardware can make your software project. So I guess today I'm going to talk about how software can make your hardware project more robust and more flexible and just kind of do stuff that is out of the realm of what's typically thought as possible. So I guess aptly named software API is for physical acts. So with all this code tonight, um, it's not extremely complicated, and I'm going to apologize beforehand if any of this seems like too elementary, that's because I intended it to be elementary. Um, I'm not assuming any knowledge about programming. Um, I removed all the advanced programming concepts from my code and just kind of made it easy to read and easy to implement on your own. Uh, but I encourage everybody to download this code, play around with it. It's a very, very basic framework. Um, and I'll explain the project that we work on together as like a demo. Um, as you can see, the hardware side is here. And then after I kind of walk through some of this code, um, well, actually, after I walk through some of the slides, I'll show you the actual code. Very readable. I added a bunch of comments to it. Um, so yeah, just download it, and I'll walk you through how to get it up and running so you can uh, utilize these, uh, these features early on. Well, uh, we'll also post this URL up on the page, so you don't have to scramble right now. Um, so at one point tonight, I'm going to have you text the number. Uh, this is the number. So if you want to input this in your phone, you can. I uh, don't. I did instruct you to text it. Don't actually do that. It's online here. Uh, just put that in your uh, like create a new text that has this phone number in it. Input some message. Uh, keep it PG um, and uh, hold off the text it until I give you the go ahead. So the first question uh, you might be asking is why should I invest in creating a software API that is kind of outside the software that I might already have to write for the hardware project that I'm working on. And so I wrote a couple of reasons why it might be important. The first one is flexibility and power. So a lot of the APIs that might power Arduinos or Raspberry Pis, um, while they are expansive, they might not give you the same amount of flexibility to manipulate data in the way that you want to or to interface with other, uh, other data APIs that you might want to. So creating an external API allows you to tap into whatever data source that you want and manipulate that into whatever form is easiest to express on hardware. Um, and so one of the things is like a lot of people try to write hardware code that does too much. And the best way to write hardware code is to basically just control all the functions that the hardware needs to operate, whether that's waiting for a trigger, opening the, the hash here. Um, and so that's what your code should really focus on. And you should leave a lot of the data processing, a lot of the um, web interfacing to an external API. Um, and how I've set up the API that we demo tonight is it does all this information, it listens to your texts, then when it hits a certain threshold, it sends a very easy trigger to this machine here. So, so that'll be demoed uh, later, and Taylor will talk a little bit more about the hardware that goes into it. Um, so another really cool thing about it is, as I just explained, this listens for a certain amount of social interactions before it does something, as you look at the content side. Um, what if you wanted to make that four-square check-ins, or what if you wanted to make that number of tweets? Um, essentially, you would have to rewrite your hardware code for each input. When you write a software API, you distill all of that down to one trigger that you send to this. So you can listen for tweets, four score check-ins, whatever you want, and at the end of the day, all, you, all you're doing is setting one trigger here. So this code never needs to change. You, you get the functionality square away, um, and then you leave the software API, which is easier to test, easier to iterate through, um, to actually set that to um, So. The example that I provided is, is in the Python programming language. And I want to give a little intuition why I showed that over some other uh, popular programming language. And most 
basically it is, um, it's described as an executable pseudocode. And so when I go through this code, um, it's going to seem like it is not even on a It's so easy to understand, so easy to read that um, if you don't have Python experience, and apologies to any Python developers out here, um, it's just extremely easy to understand what's happening, and any of you can probably just extend upon it um, using intuition and whatnot. Python is installed on every computer out of the box. Um, later I'll show kind of what I'll encourage you to use your default package manager to install the most recent version of it, but you don't even have to say you can use whatever one of them is here. Um, easy to get started, I touched on that briefly, and it's a programming language that offers an unparalleled power. And um, any idea that you might have that you want to translate into a hardware hack, easily done with Python. So, this is more of a software problem than a hardware problem, but a lot of, but a big thing that we think about is how do you structure a good API? How do you make an application that's easy to work with and flexible? Um, and the first point is the heavily modular. A modular on this um, That means that um, an API has a bunch of endpoints, so it might be slash data, slash uh, user, slash, um, etc. And each one of those endpoints should provide the minimum amount of data that you need um, to handle that functionality. So as you'll see later, we have a slash um, data endpoint that actually does provide just a dump of all the data, and it provides just the information that we need to utilize the functionality. We have a slash text endpoint um, that that is the endpoint you will all be hitting when you text it. Um, that listens for just the amount of data that we need from each one of your comments. Um, and parses that and then transmits it to the device. So um, if you're building something more complicated like a weather API or a traffic API, um, you don't want to have to receive a huge dump of data and then parse through all of that on the hardware device itself. You want to be able to control that on the um, software side of things. So, um, yeah, so basically you want it to be heavy, heavily modularized Flexible, you want it to do all the work, and as I mentioned before, you don't want the hardware code to be parsing all the data. You want it to be received in a format that's totally easy to work with once it um, gets on the hardware um, or um, So, the example that I'm providing is in Python, but you don't have to use Python to kind of attack it with this flexibility. Flask is the library that I'm using in Python. It's a really simple web server, a really simple web API um, that's fully included, and you'll see that later. Sinatra is kind of a Ruby equivalent of it, and then Express is a JS slash JavaScript server side um, framework that kind of provide the same functionality. Um, we're, we're trying to think of a way to um, build a software API and a hardware interface that kind of encapsulates the whole progress from data source to physical action. Um, and so what happens is we receive text from a phone number at a certain phone endpoint. Um, that is all stored on this endpoint and um, goes through some transformations that I'll describe. And then once a certain threshold is reached, um, it sends a quick signal to the hardware. As I mentioned, Taylor will describe that more, but that's kind of the whole system. So you, you text 10 times, or we get 10 people to text this phone number that I presented earlier, and then this device opens up. So, a little bit of a trivial example, but kind of walks you through the whole process. Um, so, a lot of this is unimportant for this demonstration. Like, right here, we're basically initializing a mask object. That's just a um, construct of the, of the uh, software that I'm using to power this web service. I'm gonna only, for now, I'm only gonna point out things that are relevant. So I'm creating a array of texts. Basically, this is just a storage container for when you set a text, it's going to be stored in there. Um, then it's going to be able to read the length of that and then act upon information in that. Um, and so right here you see the two API endpoints. These just correspond to like websites like uh, you know, foo.com slash data and foo.com slash text. Um, this one just uh, returns all the data that I have, and then this one 
can return all the data using a get request. These are HTTP verbs. Um, this is kind of the de facto way that you communicate with web services. Um, and then so from here, when you send a text, I'm setting that to be the request, the from value, which is just here the phone number that you're sending, storing that, checking to make sure that number exists, and then here I'm, I'm saving the number, the message that you're sending, and then just the time it's sent. Um, so moving down here, I actually if you send a text, I respond to that text using Twilio, which is a web service that allows you, it gives you a phone number, that allows you to respond to texts or respond or respond to phone numbers. Um, and you have to have a very like good free plan that allows you to get started with it. And this is really the meat of the program right here. So when blank, if the length of text is greater than 10, I just send a, a very easy request to the electric amp containing this code that's um, kind of unique for the device that we're using. And once that happens, the action is triggered. And that's really it. Um, I mean, software might be considered like programming software might be considered bad words in the hardware world, but I think that it really can enhance um, the awesome projects they already work.